Uruguay. Uruguay, Table of Contents All about Uruguay and Montevideo with visiting and touring information. Geography. History. Attractions. An author points of interest. Dr. Sidney Socloth. Dr. Sidney22 at gmail.com. 2023. Narration by Dr. Sidney Socloth. Zoe Phonemes. And Nathan Coltov. For a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.one slash yt navigator. Uruguay. The official name of Uruguay is the Republica Oriental del Uruguay or Oriental Republic of Uruguay. Why Oriental? We'll see why a little later. The Uruguay Independence Day is August 25, 1825. From Brazil. This is the Uruguay coat of arms. It consists of an oval crowned by a rising golden sun. The sun of May, symbolizing the rising of the Uruguayan nation. The laurel branch on the left represents honor. And the olive branch on the right represents peace. The scale represents equality and justice. The upper right quarter has the Cerro de Montevideo, Montevideo Hill, fortress on the summit, meaning strength. The galloping horse symbolizes liberty, and the ox symbolizes abundance. Where is Uruguay? Uruguay is one of the smallest countries in South America. Uruguay is bounded on the north by Brazil and on the west by Argentina. On the east is the Atlantic Ocean. And on the south is the Rio de la Plata. All of Uruguay is south of the Tropic of Capricorn. Outside the tropics. And it has a generally pleasant temperate climate. Montevideo is at the latitude of 34.9 degrees south. This is about the same distance south of the equator as Los Angeles is north. At 34.1 degrees. And Savannah at 32.1 degrees north. As a result, Montevideo has warmed to somewhat hot summers and mild winters. How big is Uruguay? Uruguay is 300 miles, or 490 kilometers, from north to south. Uruguay is 260 miles, or 415 kilometers, from west to east, at its widest point. Here is the area of the largest countries in South America in millions of square kilometers. We see that Uruguay is 11th in size and is the second smallest country in South America. Uruguay is about the same size as the U.S. state of Missouri or Oklahoma. Uruguay, at 180,000 square kilometers, is just a little bit smaller than the U.K. at 245,000 square kilometers. Uruguayan historian and novelist Eduardo Galeano wrote, on the map, Surrounded by its large neighbors, Uruguay seems tiny, but not really. We have five times more land than Holland, and five times fewer inhabitants. We have more cultivable land than Japan, and a population 40 times smaller. What does Uruguay look like? There is a relief map of Uruguay. In contrast to its neighbors to the north and west, Uruguay has gently rolling land, with an average elevation of about 383 feet, or 117 meters. Almost all of Uruguay is mostly flat countryside. The principal river is the Uruguay River, which empties into the Rio de la Plata and forms the boundary between Uruguay and Argentina. 
The highest elevations in Uruguay are Mount Catedral at 1683 feet, 513 meters, and Mount Animas at 1643 feet, 501 meters. This is the Uruguay countryside. Here is a satellite map of Uruguay. The landscape features mostly rolling plains and low hill ranges, Cuchillas, with a fertile coastal lowland. Much of Uruguay is flat grassland. That is ideal for cattle and sheep raising. The population of Uruguay. Uruguay is much smaller in population than either Argentina or Chile. The population of Uruguay is 3.4 million, making it the 10th most populous country in South America, just behind Paraguay. The most populous country in South America is Brazil, with 176 million. In terms of European countries, the population of Uruguay is comparable to that of Lithuania. With a population of 3.6 million, the population of Uruguay is comparable to the U.S. state of Connecticut. With a population of 3.4 million. What are the principal cities of Uruguay? We see that Montevideo, the capital of Uruguay, is, by a very wide margin, the principal city of Uruguay. Since the empty population of Uruguay is 3.4 million, we see that Montevideo represents over a third of the total population of the country. And almost half the people are in the metropolitan area of Montevideo. The next city in size to Montevideo is Salta, with a population of only 100,000. Montevideo the country's dominant urban center has a virtual monopoly on commerce, manufacturing, and government services. Uruguay is a predominantly urban country. In fact, Uruguay is one of the most urbanized nations in South America, with almost 90% of the people living in towns and cities. Here are some of the principal cities of Uruguay. Here are some of the principal cities of Uruguay. Uruguay is quite remote from the United States, Canada, and Europe. The distance between Montevideo and New York City is 5,340 miles or 8,600 kilometers, as the crow flies. The distance between Montevideo and London in the UK is 6,858 miles or 11,040 kilometers as the crow flies. In comparison, the distance between London and New York City is 3,463 miles or 5,572 kilometers or only half the distance between London and Montevideo. A major gateway city for airline flights from North America to Montevideo is Miami, Florida. The distance from Miami to Montevideo is 4,471 miles or 7,200 kilometers. Uruguayans are of predominantly European origin, mostly descendants of 19th and 20th century immigrants from Spain and Italy and to a much lesser degree, from France and Britain. Few direct descendants of Uruguay's indigenous peoples remain. Caucasians represent the great majority of the population at 88%. Mestizo, mixed white and native Amerindian, account for 8%. And 4% of the population is of African descent. Spanish is spoken throughout Uruguay. Although in Rivera and other borderland towns close to Brazil, an admixture of Portuguese and Spanish can be heard, often in a slang called Portunhal, from the words Portuguese and Espanhol. Like the rest of South America Uruguay is predominantly Roman Catholic, 
with two-thirds of the people being of that faith? Only two percent are Protestant, and about one percent are Jewish. The climate of Uruguay. Will it be hot in Uruguay? Or will it be cold? Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year in Montevideo. The summertime highs in December through February are in the 80 degree Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius range. Nights are pleasantly cool at around 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 16 degrees Celsius. The winter months in Montevideo are pleasant with highs of about 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 16 degrees Celsius. But the nights can be chilly in the 42 degree Fahrenheit or 6 degrees Celsius range. Uruguay Rainfall Here is the rainfall throughout the year in Montevideo. The yearly total is 37 inches or 950 millimeters. We see that there is no pronounced rainy season. Although March and April do have more rain. The money of Uruguay. The money of Uruguay. Currency exchange rates can change daily. For the latest exchange rate, click on this icon. 1 Uruguayan peso equals 2.6 US cents. And 1 US dollar equals 39 Uruguayan pesos. 5 Uruguayan pesos equals 0.13 US dollars. 1 US dollar equals 39 Uruguayan pesos. This is an Uruguayan postage stamp. Note the sign that looks like a dollar sign but has just one vertical bar. That is the sign for pesos. The economy of Uruguay. Uruguay's gross national product GNP per capita is among the highest in Latin America. And the nation has a large urban middle class. This is the gross domestic product, or GDP, of South American countries in billions of U.S. dollars. We see that because of the relatively small population of Uruguay as compared to such countries as Brazil and Argentina. The total GDP ranks as only eighth among the South American countries. Uruguay's relatively high standard of living has historically been based on earnings from agricultural exports notably wool and beef. Nevertheless, they have been subject to fluctuations in the world market. The agricultural products of Uruguay include sheep, cattle, rice, corn, barley and fish. What does Uruguay sell? Principal exports are meat, rice, leather products, wool, fish and dairy products. Principal exports are meat, rice, leather products, wool, fish and dairy products. What does Uruguay buy? This is what Uruguay buys. These are the principal import trading partners of Uruguay. The history of Uruguay. The name Uruguay comes from Guarani the language of the native people of the region, and means river of the painted birds. In 1516, the Spanish Navy ghetto, Juan Dios de Solis, was killed by indigenous people while exploring the Rio de la Plata. His death discouraged further European colonization for more than 100 years. Both Spain and Portugal pursued the colonization of Uruguay, with the Spanish eventually gaining control. Montevideo was founded in 1726 by Bruno Mauricio de Zabala, governor of Buenos Aires. That was done to counteract the Portuguese advance into the area from Brazil. However, Montevideo was considered a military center for the Spanish Empire. 
while Buenos Aires was a commercial center. In 1776 Uruguay became part of the Viceroyalty of La Plata, which had its capital at Buenos Aires. In the early 19th century, independence movements sprung up across South America, including Uruguay. Uruguay was then known as the Banda Oriental, or Eastern Area, referring to the area east of the Rio de la Plata. In 1808, Uruguay rebelled against the Viceroyalty of La Plata following the overthrow of the Spanish monarchy by Napoleon Bonaparte. Uruguayan territory was contested between the new states of Brazil and Argentina. From 1812 to 1820, the Orientales, or Uruguayans from the eastern side of the River Plata, fought against Argentinian and Brazilian invaders. Brazil annexed the area in 1821 under the name of Provincia Cisplatina, or province on this side of the River Plate. A revolt began in 1825, after which Uruguay became an independent country with the Treaty of Montevideo in 1828. In 1828, Brazil and Argentina renounced claims to the territory that became the Eastern Republic of Uruguay. In 1830, a constitution was approved. From 1838 to 1865, civil war raged between the Whites, the future Conservative Party, and the Colorados, or Reds, the future Liberals. From 1865 to 1870, Uruguay joined Argentina and Brazil in the War of the Triple Alliance against Paraguay, which was defeated. The work of President José Botle y Ordonajes made Uruguay an advanced nation with a complex welfare system. Between 1903 and 1915, reformist President José Botle y Ordonajes gave women the franchise, established a welfare state, disestablished the church, and abolished the death penalty. This was during two successive terms as president. For most of the 20th century, Uruguay was on par with European nations. Due to its advanced social system and its stable democracy, Uruguay came to be known as the Switzerland of the Americas. The Uruguayan economy relied mainly on agricultural exports. The world wars brought prosperity as Uruguayan beef and grain went to feed a war-ravaged Europe. World food prices dropped precipitously following the end of World War II, which triggered years of decline for the Uruguayan economy. In the 1950s, Uruguay experienced dictatorship, guerrilla warfare, and a return to democracy with a series of elected and appointed presidents. It experienced conflicts with neighboring states political and economic fluctuations and modernization, and large inflows of immigrants, mostly from Europe. In the 1960s, the stable social system began to break down as the economy spiraled downward. The government lost popular support as students, workers and lower class families felt the pain of a country, unable to adapt to a post-agricultural world economy. In 1973, the army seized power, ushering in 11 years of military dictatorship in what was once one of the most stable democracies in the region. In 1984, democracy was finally restored with the election of Julio Maria San Quinetti. Montevideo is on a deep bay at the mouth of the Rio de la Plata. Montevideo is on the Rio de la Plata estuary. 137 miles or 221 kilometers east of Buenos Aires. Montevideo blends historic areas with tall office towers and modern shopping centers. The old city, with many museums, open-air markets, and restaurants, remains the heart of Montevideo and sees thousands of international visitors each year. This is a map of Montevideo. 
Montevideo was founded in 1726 by the governor of Buenos Aires to counteract the Portuguese advance into the area from Brazil. It was named Montevideo, meaning I see the mountain, because of a cone-shaped hill on the mainland. The small peninsula that the city occupies encloses one of the few good harbors in all of South America. The port of Montevideo handles most of Uruguay's foreign trade. The chief exports are wool, meat, and hides. Numerous establishments in the capital process wool. Refrigerated packing plants are equipped to prepare meat, textile, shoe, soap, match, and clothing factories are located throughout the city. Wine and dairy products are also produced. Ships dock at Puerto de Montevideo, and the terminal is very close to the city center. It is approximately one mile from the Pi to the Cinta of town. Metered taxis are readily available at the port, and it is very easy and reasonable to hire a cab at a negotiated rate for the day. This is the Montevideo port in downtown area. Montevideo is an Arcanex delight, with styles ranging from colonial to art deco. Sidewalk cafes, chick shops, restaurants, parks, gardens and casinos can be found within the city limits. This is an example of the colonial style in Montevideo. Shopping is to be found in a few downtown shops along Avenida de San Octavo de Julio and around Plaza Independencia. This shows the location of Plaza Independencia and Avenida de San Octavo de Julio. This is Avenida de San Octavo de Julio and the Plaza Independencia. On the right is the Tower of Palacio Salvo. Plaza Independencia, or Independent Square, is the main square of modern Montevideo, located immediately before the historic downtown. A statue of General Gervasio Artigas, the father of Uruguay, is the focal point of Independence Square in the center of town. The general's ashes are contained at the base of the statue, and at night a spotlight is turned on the urn so that he will never be in the dark. There is also a shopping mall downtown at Avenida Luis Alberti de Herrera. The most impressive landmark is the three-story Palacio Legislativo, built in 1908. This is the Palacio Legislativo. This legislative palace is open to the public. Perhaps the most interesting museum in Montevideo is the Museo del Gaucho y la Moneda. This museum pays homage to the heart and soul of Uruguay, the Gaucho. The Museo del Gaucho la Moneda has an impressive mate display, a hollowed out gourd that is used for cowboy tea. The Museo Histórico Nacional is another place to visit. This shows the location of the Museo Histórico Nacional. The Bullock Wagon, La Carreta, is an impressive sculpture that is a reminder of the hardships of the first immigrants. There are 18th century buildings in Ciudad Vieja or Old Town. This shows the location of the Ciudad Vieja, Old Town. This shows the location of the Plaza Mahatris in Ciudad Vieja. This is one of the old buildings on Plaza Mahatris. This is Plaza Mahatris with the Cathedral and the Chamber of Commerce. This was the center of old Montevideo. La Rambla is a street that follows the beaches from Old City to Carrasco. This shows the location of La Rambla. Puerta de la Ciudadela is the only door left from the ancient city wall. Today it is the entrance to downtown. The Plaza Entrevero is in the city center. It is named after the sculpture which characterizes the square. It is an entanglement, or in Spanish, Entrevero, of riders and horses. This shows the location of the Plaza Entrevero. This is the Plaza Entrevero. 
In the afternoon and on weekends, the Mercado del Puerto, the port market, is always bustling. This shows the location of the Mercado del Puerto. Higher education in Uruguay is available only in the capital. The Universidad de la República was founded in 1849. The Universidad del Trabajo del Uruguay, 1878, provides vocational training through industrial and night schools. Teatro Solis was opened in 1856 and is still in existence. This shows the location of Teatro Solis. The city also houses the Museo Histórico Nacional, 1900. The Museo Nacional de Historia Natural, 1837. The Museo de Bellas Artes, 1911. And the Biblioteca Nacional del Uruguay, 1816. This is El Museo Nacional de Artes Visuales. This is the Palacio Municipal, the Montevideo City Hall. Years ago, Hotel Casino Carrasco was the most exclusive hotel in Montevideo. This is the Barrio Rus before renovation. The Reus Quarter, Barrio Reus, is an example of a successful living space renovation. This is the exclusive quarter, Positus. This is the beach in Montevideo. The beach in Montevideo. Punta del Este. People travel to Punta del Este to enjoy the beauty of an ocean beach and crystal clear waters. Punta del Este is 86 miles, or 138 kilometers, east of Montevideo. Punta del Este is the premier resort city of Uruguay. This is Punta del Este. This is a view of Punta del Este. The Battle of the River Plate on December 13, 1939 was the first major naval battle of World War II. The Battle of the River Plate was the first British naval victory of World War II. It is also a fascinating story. The battle was fought off the coast of Uruguay between three Allied warships, the cruisers Exeter and Ajax of the British Royal Navy, and the New Zealand cruiser Achilles, against the German battleship Admiral Graf Spee. The Panzer Schiff or Armoured Ship Admiral Graf Spee was launched in 1934 at the Marine Wharf in Wilhelmshaven, Germany. The Admiral Graf Spee was commissioned in 1936. It was the most modern of the three pocket battleships, which were the pride of Hitler's naval fleet. Here is the Admiral Graf Spee, HMS Resolution Middle, and HMS Hood background at the Spithead Naval Review for the coronation of King George VI in 1937. The ship was named after a German admiral, Maximilian Graf von Spee, who served in the Imperial German Navy, or Kaiser Liche Mahrine, from 1878 to 1914. During World War I, he died in the naval battle of the Falkland Islands. The German ships we called pocket battleships because one of the conditions of the Treaty of Versailles was that the Germans were not allowed to build ships of the true battleship size. Conceived in 1928, the new warships were designed according to weight restrictions of 10,000 tons as imposed by the 1919 Versailles Treaty. They carried massive 11-inch guns. Having high control towers, they resembled small battleships. The brilliantly engineered warships had newly designed diesel engines and electrically welded hulls. Reputed to be faster than a battleship and more powerful than a cruiser, they caused alarm in international naval circles. Admiral Graf Spee, commissioned in 1936, was the most modern of these ships. 
Admiral Graf Spee was one of Germany's three pocket battleships Vestentaschen Schlechtschiffe. Germany built these armored ships, Panzerschiffe, to add strength and prestige to the severely depleted fleet after World War I. At the outbreak of World War II, the pride of the German Navy consisted of three pocket battleships, the Deutschland, Admiral von Skier and Admiral Graf Spee, which caused deep concern to the British Royal Navy. As Hitler boasted that Britannia would no longer rule the waves. The first pocket battleship was launched in 1931 as Pan's airship A. The Deutschland. At the Deutsche Werke in Kiel, Germany. This is the Pan's airship Deutschland. Although the ship succeeded the weight restriction of Versailles, they lacked comparable armored protection for any claim to battleship status. This was a well-kept secret until the Battle of the River Plate when the Graf Spee was found to be deficient. The Deutschland was renamed the Lutso in 1940. At the end of World War II, it was blown up at Svinemunde in 1945. The second in the series of pocket battleships was the Panzerschiff B, the Admiral von Skier. It was launched in 1934 at Mahri Neverft in Wilhelmshaven. The Admiral von Skier was sunk by bombs in the closing days of World War II on April 10, 1945, at Kiel. Called pocket battleships. Deutschland Admiral Schie and Admiral Graf Spee held the premier position in the German fleet in the 1930s. The German Navy Chief Admiral Redder had dispatched these three pocket battleships into the outer oceans to serve as commerce raiders. The Graf Spee had proved the most troublesome after sinking several vessels in the Indian Ocean and South Atlantic during the early months of the war. The Graf Spee left Wilhelmshaven in August 1939 with orders to take position in the South Atlantic in September. She sank one ship four more in October, and one more in the Indian Ocean in November. Homeward bound in December, she sank three more ships for a grand total of nine. Four large groups of Allied ships were now hunting the elusive raider. A total of nine British freighters of 50,000 tons had gone to the bottom, but no lives were lost in accordance with the Hague Conventions. The crews were taken off before the ships were sunk. The commander of the Graf Spee was Captain Hans Langsdorf. And by all accounts, he was a gentleman of the old school. According to one source, he has gone down in history as a man who gave the world a matchless example of personal integrity and human compassion. A book was written about Langsdorf called Prince of Honor. Hans Wilhelm Langsdorf was the son of a Dusseldorf judge. A compelling desi to emulate the chivalrous reputation of Vice Admiral Graf von Spee reinforced his boyhood passion for travel and adventure. He joined the German Imperial Navy in 1912. In 1916 he saw frontline action at the Battle of Jutland and served the remainder of World War I commanding minesweepers. Captain Langsdorf took command of Admiral Graf Spee in 1938. Langsdorf abided strictly by the Hague Convention. He ensured that the crews were taken off all the ships he sunk before he sunk them. He had sunk nine ships without the loss of a single life, and none of the 62 prisoners on board the Graf Spee were injured, even during the subsequent battle. Commodore Harwood of the Royal Navy was commanding Force G based on the Falklands, consisting of the heavy cruisers Exeter and Cumberland and the light cruisers Ajax and Achilles. From the pattern of the Graf Spee's successful sinkings of Allied ships, Commodore Harwood rightly surmised that she would appear off the Rio de la Plata by December, as that area was a potential hunting ground for rich prizes. Harwood, therefore, led his force in that direction. Unfortunately minus the 8-inch gun, 
heavy cruiser Cumberland, whose presence would have provided him with a measure of parity against the larger Graf Spee. His force consisted of the 8-inch Exeter and the 6-inch Ajax and Achilles. The British naval intelligence estimated where the Graf Spee was headed and set an ambush for her. The Allied ships decided to lay in wait for it off the coast of Uruguay. Thinking that the Graf Spee would put into either Montevideo or Buenos Aires on her way home. On the morning of December 13, 1939, Ajax, Achilles, and Exeter met the Graf Spee in deadly combat. 400 kilometers or 250 miles off the Atlantic coast of Uruguay. Although it was three ships against one, the Graf Spee was a much bigger ship with much bigger guns than the other ships. As a result, the battle did not start out well for the British. The Graf Spee started by concentrating its fee on the heaviest and best armed of the Allied ships. The Exeter. After the first ten minutes of the battle, the Exeter was basically a floating wreck. The main gun turrets of the Exeter were gone and one direct hit had taken out the bridge, killing nearly all the officers except the captain. However, the Ajax and the Achilles had been peppering away at the German ship too, and the Exeter had also got off enough shots to inflict some fairly severe damage of its own. This is His Majesty's New Zealand ship, HMNZS Achilles. The last despairing salvo from the Exeter scored at a direct hit on the control tower of the Graf Spee. That killed several officers in ratings and, more importantly, took out the Graf Spee's range finder. After this, the captain of the Exeter decided to break off the fighting and limped off toward the Falklands for repairs. Langsdorff went around the Graf Spee to assess the damage. He then told his navigator, We must run into port. The ship is not now seaworthy for the North Atlantic. Langsdorff decided to head for Montevideo Harbour, pursued by the remaining Allied cruisers. The British had won their first battle of the war, and 108 men had died. Langsdorff reported, I have taken 15 hits, food stores and galleys destroyed. I am heading for Montevideo. Uruguay was a neutral country at this stage. However, Uruguay had a pro-British president, a pro-French foreign minister, and an influential British embassy. The Graf Spee could hardly have selected a more hostile haven. The first order of business was to set free the sailors who had been taken prisoner from the merchant vessels. Many of the crew members were also allowed ashore, in full uniform, for the burial of the 36 Graf Spee crew members killed. Under international law, the Graf Spee was allowed to stay in the neutral port for 24 hours to effect repairs. This was extended to 72 hours by Uruguayan presidential decree. The 72 hours was not enough time to get the ship ready for sea and for battle. It was also low on ammunition in addition. The ship's galley and food stores had been destroyed. There was another international law that said a belligerent vessel could not leave a neutral port for 24 hours after an enemy ship had left. So the British sent a cargo ship to slip out every 24 hours to keep the Graf Bay in Montevideo, until they could get reinforcements in place to finish it off. The problem was that they didn't have that many cargo ships in port. One more Allied warship, the Cumberland, had already arrived to join the blockade, and a task force of five more, including the aircraft carrier Ark Royal, was heading down the coast from Rio de Janeiro. Those ships were still several days away, but through press reports and radio, the impression was created that there was a large armada waiting just outside neutral waters. It was then that the British came up with a plan to convince the Germans that reinforcements had arrived and that even the Graf Spee could not take on three cruisers. 
one battle cruiser and one aircraft carry. Extra fuel for the ships was ordered in Argentina. And the information was leaked to the Germans via the Argentinian press as the fuel was due to be acquired from the Argentinian naval base at Mar del Plata. The Germans fell for this. Langsdorf believed that the British force now numbered five ships, including an aircraft carry. Langsdorf had two choices. He could fight the British or scuttle the ship so that it did not fall into the hands of the British. On the 16th of December 1939, the German Navy Chief Admiral Reeder arrived at the Chancellery with the latest cable from the ship's captain. Uh, apart from the British cruisers and destroyers, the aircraft carrier Ark Royal and the battlecruiser Renown have joined the naval forces to tightly block our escape route. No prospect of breaking out into the open sea or reaching home. B. Propose emerging as far as neutral waters limit and attempt to fight through to Buenos Aires using remaining ammunition. C. Breakout would result in certain destruction of Graf A with no chance of damaging enemy ships. Request decision whether to scuttle despite inadequate depth of water or accept internment. So, what was Langsdorff to do? The word from Hitler was that he must attempt to fight his way out to the open sea or go down in the attempt. Langsdorff and the Kriegsmarine headquarters didn't think this was such a good idea. So, they came up with another plan. Uruguay asserted her sovereign rights and demanded that the Graf Spee must leave Uruguayan waters before 8 p.m. Sunday, the 17th of December or face internment. At 6.45 p.m. on the 17th of December, at the expiry of the 72-hour time limit, the Graf Spee fired up its engines pulled anchor and sailed out the exit channel into the river. A German cargo ship that was also in the port had secretly taken the warship's crew aboard. It sailed out of the harbor a few minutes after the Graf Spee. Captain Langstorff remained on his pocket battleship with only a skeleton crew. When the Graf Spee reached four miles off the coast, the engines we shut down and the ship was scuttled. It was blown up by its own torpedoes, which we rigged to explode after the crew had been taken off. It blew up in a gigantic explosion. This is the Admiral Graf Spee, scuttled by her own crew. On December 17, 1939, the Admiral Graf Spee scuttled by her own crew. December 17, 1939. This again is the Admiral Graf Spee being scuttled by her own crew. December 17, 1939. This is how it looked the next morning. The next day, 1100 tired and hungry German sailors arrived in Buenos Aires Harbor. Their captain persuasively argued that they should be accepted in Argentina as refugees from a shipwreck. The Argentine authorities reasoned that this made perfect sense. After all, the ship had sunk. So, that's where they stayed. Although interned, for the remainder of the war. Many of them remained in Argentina after the war. Three days after the scuttling of the Graf Spee, Captain Hans Langsdorff wrote three farewell letters. One included the words, For a captain with a sense of honor, it goes without saying that his personal fate cannot be separated from that of his ship. I am quite happy to pay with my life for any possible reflection on the honor of the flag. Then, dressed in his full naval uniform, he positioned himself on the ship's battle flag and committed suicide with a revolver borrowed from the German embassy. His funeral was with full military honors. Captain Hans Langsdorff was buried in the German section of El Cementerio de la Chacarita in Buenos Aires.
The wreck of the Graf Spee remains at the bottom of the river plate in only 7 to 8 meters of water. The superstructure was taken down, and the site is marked by a couple of buoys. One of the ship's guns was salvaged and is now on display in a riverside park in Montevideo. The British made a movie of the story in 1957 called The Battle of the River Plate. The Americans released it under a different name. Pursuit of the Graf Spee. It starred Peter Finch as Hans Langsdorff and Anthony Quayle as Jamado Harwood, the commander of the Allied fleet. Langsdorff's significant role in the dramatic saga of the Graf Spee has remained obscure. Respected historians have dismissed him as a first-class person, but an unimaginative warrior. Admiral Ritter left a black mark on the captain's military record in his post-war writings when he blamed Langsdorff for losing his ship by attacking three cruisers and going against general orders. This half-truth has plagued Langsdorff's career for 60 years. Redder claimed that Langsdorff had lost Graf Spee when he ignored standing orders not to seek battle with warships, privately. He sent a letter to Elizabeth Langsdorff, praising her son as an excellent officer and remarking favorably on his noble character. In the Falklands, the gallant Exeter was once again made seaworthy after tremendous repair effort in February 1940. The cruiser returned to Plymouth Harbor. As she sailed in, the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, took the salute. Later, addressing the ship's company, he paid glowing tributes to the role of Exeter in the River Plate, saying, This great action will long be told in song and story. Recommended Videos, Uruguay Recommended video, Uruguay Tourist Attractions Minus 15 Top Places to Visit Recommended video, Montevideo Vacation Travel Guide, Expedia Recommended video, Why do Paraguay and Uruguay have such similar names? Recommended videos, Graf Spee. Recommended video, Sinking of the German battle cruiser Graf Spee Newsreel. Recommended video, Graf Spee, pocket battleship scuttled by Nazis. Uruguay, table of contents. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.